Welcome back to Just Chatting, and this is the series of videos we do on Thursday and Sunday evenings just for our own entertainment. So, for all of you Audi fans, he is not with us right now. He is over in Jane's yard, making himself useful and chasing vermin and getting treats and cuddles. He may well be with us before we are through, but for the moment, we're going to have to carry on without him. So, I have something different today, because Nutmeg and the Ginger Sock Puppet have been remarkably quiet for the last couple of months, Nutmeg especially. And the good thing about this is it gives an opportunity to go back and do deep dives on other issues that have cropped up in the past, or a bit of a retrospective on the things we have witnessed. When, when their antics are firing off bang, bang, bang like a Gatling gun, it can be very, very difficult to assess the true nature of the damage they are causing or the implications of that damage. It can be especially difficult if, like me, you try to tease out patterns that might help predict what's going to happen in the future. So today I am going to take a look at three, I know only three, three of what I consider personally to be Nutmeg's worst behaviors and and actions. So when we come back, we will get started. So for this first one, I am going back 30 years for this pivotal moment in Little Nutmeg's life. And that was the whole Procter and Gamble ad that she protested and they changed it and she is a feminist pioneer. Well, we all know the story by now. Procter & Gamble had an ad campaign that was inherently sexist. And according to Nick News from Nickelodeon, and I have a link to that video, which is on YouTube. I have a link in the video notes. Check it out for yourself. It started off as a social studies project in school when Nutmeg was somewhere around 11 years old. The class was instructed to watch commercials with sexist content. And they found a lot, and Nutmeg subsequently wrote a letter to Procter & Gamble protesting the sexist language. Now, the only thing that's, that's fuzzy here is if she did this on behalf of the entire class, which is rather what the Nickelodeon uh, clip indicates, or if she did it at her father's suggestion, which is what Tom Bauer's book Revenge puts forth, but it's very clear what happened. She wrote a letter, Procter & Gamble changed the ad, and Nutmeg has been exploiting that for the last 30 years, claiming that she was single-handedly responsible for changing this ad campaign, Nutmeg, feminist icon. Well, let's take a look for a moment at Tom Bauer's version of what took place. It's very quick. It's only a couple minutes. Here you go. In the mid-90s, TV adverts stereotyped women. The American corporation Procter & Gamble used the tagline to promote ivory-clear dishwashing liquid, quote, 
women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. Megan was infuriated. Why women? Why not men? Thomas Markle knew that thousands of American women were similarly annoyed. Many had sent protests to Procter & Gamble. With her father's encouragement, Megan joined the bandwagon. She wrote to Procter & Gamble's chairman and also to Hillary Clinton, the First Lady. Like other protesters, she urged that the slogan should be changed to, quote, people all over America. After she received no reply, Thomas wrote follow-up letters demanding that the corporation and Clinton acknowledge his daughter. Nothing happened. Using his contacts, Thomas arranged for Linda Ellerby, a host on Nickelodeon, a children's TV channel run by Lucky Duck Productions, to report Megan's protest at her school. Seeing herself interviewed on the broadcast TV film report, accompanied by a reenactment clip of her, quote, writing to Clinton, naturally boosted Megan's self-confidence. Some weeks later, Procter & Gamble bowed to the thousands of protests and changed the advertisement's strap line. Although Thomas knew that Megan's letter had not influenced the executive's decision, there was no evidence that her letter was even read. He encouraged her conviction that the change was her personal victory. Retelling her story to women at the ABC studios won her popularity. They allowed her to use an office for homework. The experience would be employed by Megan as a milestone. Bauer later goes on to say in, in a very short little excerpt that I'm not going to bother to read you, just going to paraphrase, that later when Nutmeg was admitted to Immaculate Heart High School, it was largely because of this Procter & Gamble episode, which clearly she made sure they were aware of. Tom Markle, her father, was rather surprised by this. So, she has been using that ever since. She used that as a springboard to get herself in association with UN women and gave a speech all about this. What's the reality? Well, I think we all know what the reality is. There was a school project. She wrote a letter, a letter that no one ever responded to. Hillary Clinton never responded to the letter. Procter & Gamble never responded to the letter. Thousands of other people had written and complained and protested. It's important to keep in mind that in this period, which would be the early 1990s, there was a very high percentage of women in the workforce. And a lot of people were deeply offended by this. Procter & Gamble came around and changed the ad. Did they do it because of Nutmeg's letter? Absolutely not. As Bauer's book indicates, there was not even a scrap of evidence to indicate they had ever even read the letter period. So she has, for the last 30 years, taken what is somewhere between an outright lie and a childhood fantasy and used this to enhance her own cred as a feminist, to gain, to gain status for herself as a, a door opener got her into a nice private school, I probably managed to get her into the company of people like Gloria Steinem and Hillary Clinton. She has marketed this. She's marketed this to the extreme. Is it true? No, no. It is a made-up story. There are certainly some elements in this that are true. Yeah, they did have that ad. Yeah, she probably did write a letter. Tom Markle says she did. But 
did anything else flow from this? Absolutely not. Everything else is just fantasy. So there are a couple of reasons that I think this is important and why I would put it on our list. One, Nutmeg has been dining out on this story for 30 years. So it's clearly pivotal for her. Two, it is absolutely indicative of her carelessness with the truth, her willingness to take a story that might have a grain of truth, reframe it, remold it, and throw it out there and say, look at me. The fact that she started doing this at such an early age, uh, well, uh, again, that goes back to the fact that I say she is a histrionic rather than a narcissist because histrionic personality disorder manifests in childhood and narcissistic personality disorder does not. And that's DSM-5. The fact is, this was a very early indication of a pattern of behavior that she has amply demonstrated throughout the rest of her life. So that's why I would hold this out to be important. So, number two on Nutmeg's greatest hits list, the miscarriage. In the fall of 2019, when Nutmeg's invasion of privacy suit against the Mail on Sunday was scheduled to begin in January of 2021, Nutmeg's attorneys went to the courts and asked for a delay, a postponement. And they were granted a postponement for, quote, a confidential reason. The courts never expressed the reason. Now, if it had been anything in the ordinary course of events, for example, more time to prepare for the trial, you know, a, a witness being sick, anything like that, it would have been a matter of public record. It is not. There was a lot of speculation at the time that Nutmeg was pregnant, that she couldn't go forward because of a pregnancy, because the trial was scheduled for a year later. Some are expected to be scheduled for a year later, sometime in September or October. Uh, did she tell the court she was pregnant? Well, I can't say for sure, but if I were going to place a bet, I would say, yeah, she probably did. Hence the need to get rid of the fantasy baby. So, a year after this, she writes an op-ed piece in the New York Times describing a miscarriage she allegedly had in great detail sometime in early summer. The story, which as I say, was told in the New York Times in great detail and allegedly cribbed pretty heavily from another woman's miscarriage story, but we're going to walk away from that for a moment. Uh, the miscarriage story has changed. As I said, it was very detailed. And subsequently, in the Netflix docudrama, whole different miscarriage story. She was not alone changing her baby's diapers, as she had said in the New York Times. Now, she was in going into her house with her friend and collapsing on the floor in the doorway completely freaking different. So, which is true. Uh, and frankly, they both can't be true, but they both can be false. So, if I were to bet, my money would be on no miscarriage. My money would be on this was merely a ploy to gain more time for the lawsuit because at the time, in late 2019, she also had um, a motion before the court for a summary judgment. And certainly more time for uh, the summary judgment, more time for the trial 
was in her best interests. She wanted this to go away before she would be required to testify. And we all know why, because she lied to the courts. Harry lied uh, to, well, Harry actually was on record because Jason Knopf has emails stating, uh, these are emails from Harry, stating, well, yes, I can see that it would be best if if we had plausible deniability, if the information didn't come from us, but it still needs to come from us. Here you go. This, everything surrounding this was filthy. And there was no way either Nutmeg or her sock puppet would come out of that trial if they had to testify with their reputations intact. And I think she knew that. So, did she, in fact, make up a story about being pregnant and then, of necessity, make up a story about having a miscarriage? If I were betting, that's what I would bet on. And we have to pull in, subsequently, the bits of spare. Remember the sock puppet's bizarre little autobiography? in which he claims they left the hospital with a little package of biological material from the miscarriage, which they buried illegally uh, at the foot of a banyan tree. Every iteration of this story is less credible than the one that came before it. So, why would I put this on my list? I would put this on my list because as a pattern of behavior, it shows that Nutmeg will not only create a false narrative, but then double down on it when it looks like it's being exposed, pull more people in. Remember, she had a friend that she roped into saying, oh, I saw the miscarriage. I, wow. And this is after that story had come out in the Times indicating she was baby changing. It shows that she does not care if her stories are consistent. It shows that under, under the threat of any challenge at all, she will simply double down and stick to her story, no matter how ridiculous and no matter how much it changes. It also shows, because this is out there for the media, it also shows that the media is very, very reluctant to touch any of their bizarre fabrications. They're just not doing it. And where is the voice of the media saying, I do not believe the sock puppet was given a box of biological material from a hospital and allowed to bury it. Perhaps the UK media might not pick up on that. I don't know what burial law is in the UK, but the US media certainly knows what burial law is here in this country. So somebody at the very least should have said, excuse me, did you have a permit for that? No one did. So I think that illustrates another set of problems. So, Number three on our hit parade, and these are not in any particular order. They are just, in my opinion, the top three, is her relationship with her family. The ease with which she moves people in and out of her life. They come in when they are useful. They leave when they are not. Her familial relationships are characterized by abuse and exploitation. And this is indeed serious. Her father, whom she repeatedly spoke highly of in her blog, The Tig, as soon as he became inconvenient, was dumped. The fact that he gave her everything when she was a child put her in the best schools and paying for it, and even continued to support her after she graduated college while she was out 
looking for work until such time as yet another family member, her future husband, took over that responsibility. It's forgotten. He was out. Now, I did a video, uh, so you all know it is my personal opinion that she was responsible for setting up those paparazzi photos that she later used to discredit her father and keep him out of her wedding. What can I say? She then had the same sort of relationship with her husband, Trevor. Trevor was useful to her, provided contacts, introductions, even gave her roles in movies he produced. When she finally landed the role in Suits, which had to have been at least in part because of the work Trevor had done earlier in her career to help her get at least, at least get a walk in through the door, so to speak. No, she got that. Trevor's gone. Her brother and sister, Tom Jr. and Samantha, they were important parts of her life when she was a child. They were much older, yes, but they took care of her. They played with her. I have no idea if she realizes how very, very lucky she was because back in the 1980s, I, I knew many, many families that would have balked at accepting a biracial child into their lives. The Markles, no. I don't even think she realizes how lucky she was, given the attitude some people had at the time. Well, some people still have today. She didn't get that from them. They were totally accepting of her, of her mother. No, gone. Inconvenient. Her uncle Mike, Tom's brother, this is the man who arranged that internship at the Argentine embassy uh, that she, again, uses just like she uses the Procter & Gamble story. Again, it was a student internship arranged by her uncle who worked for the State Department. But as far as everyone is concerned, she was practically the ambassador to all of South America. She took that one little thing and just puffed it up as she does. As I say, behavior patterns, you can see them. Mike did that for her, a story that got her so much mileage and still gets her mileage. And was he invited to her wedding? No. Is anybody prepared to say he wouldn't have shown well? No. The man would have shown well. Thank you very much. No, she just he was done. His usefulness was over. So he was iced out of her life. Uh, she has another Markle uncle, by the way, um, Frederick. He goes by Dismas now. He is a reclusive holy man. I always thought it would have been a good idea if he had been invited to the wedding because Prince Philip's mother, Princess Alice, was in fact a reclusive holy woman. I'm sure Philip would have gotten along extremely well with Uncle Dismas, but they missed the opportunity. It goes on. Uh, Trevor was very convenient, taking care of her, making introductions, gone. Uh, then afterward, Corey Vitiello, someone who was useful in introducing her around Toronto society, gone. He wasn't family, but certainly he was a live-in partner, a very, very close person. I would say the fact that the media is not looking at this, the toxicity of these relationships, one after another after another. She is a serial markler. And yes, markling is in the Urban Dictionary, and it does mean ghosting someone without giving them a moment's thought. So I would say what we have are three separate incidents that, that show 
different patterns of behavior. Some of them are repeated through the stories. For example, the Procter & Gamble story. When we look at the Dist family, we see Mike and the Argentine Embassy story. Same thing, tiny grain of truth. She was a college student intern, spent six weeks there, and suddenly that gets puffed into something grand and elaborate. She worked for the Argentine Embassy. No, not really. So we see the patterns, and that's why I would throw these out there, these three, as patterns of behavior that deserve closer scrutiny, that demand that we watch them, that, that tell us a lot about what we can expect in the future. She gets caught in a lie, she'll double down. She will not back down. Um, she doesn't like the way a narrative plays. She'll just change it. Just change it up. It'll probably still be a fantasy, but it'll be a totally different fantasy without any regard for the fact that it contradicts the fantasy that immediately preceded it. And this just goes on and on. So that is what I have for you today. I am grateful to nutmeg that we've had a little peace and quiet because it does provide an opportunity to look at things that are not necessarily current because none of these stories that I've just related are current. They're not in the news right now, but they are things that we should be looking at. We should cast back. We should allow ourselves to be enlightened by her history, we should let that inform our opinions of what's going on now and what we're likely to see in the future. And a little quiet, a little respite from her usual clamoring for attention does provide us a chance at that. All right, so that is what I have for you today. We will be taking a look at a slideshow on our way out. Uh, we're going to do the slideshow of the little Audie themed giveaways because the giveaways are still going on. They will be uh, they will be over on the Sumi's Angels Facebook page and here are the angels so you can take a look and it does spell out the Facebook page name. So go on over, check them out, sign up for the giveaway, all of this is Audi themed stuff, and we will see you all next week. So have a terrific day.